My name is Mac Gervais. I'm the lead pastor and planter of Church Project West Chase over on the west side of town, the West Chase area, if you couldn't catch up from the name. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to be here. I, I think I say this every time that I, I come here, but uh, your pastor, John, I love that guy. I love the, the, the Wethingtons, that family. Um, I've known John for a long time now, uh, which is wild to think about. And it's been a pleasure to watch what God has been doing here in the Garden Oaks area. Um, through this church. And so, you know, anytime me and my wife, Grace, get to come and worship with you guys to, 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 to be around what God is doing, it is truly life-giving and exciting for me. And so uh, we didn't come here to hear me talk about how much I like your pastors and elders, but uh, we came here to read from the Word of God. So uh, I'm going to ask you to do something with me. If you would stand and turn your Bibles to Psalm 24. If you got a Bible, then open it up. If you got a Bible app, then, you know, uh, pull that up. But we're going to read from God's Word here in Psalm 24 uh, this morning. And this is what it says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who, do, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to read your word, to learn, to worship, to sing songs together. And God, as we uh, gather in your presence, we'll let all the distractions that might preoccupy our thoughts fade away. And Lord, let us singularly be focused on you. Convict us where you need to convict us. Encourage us where you need to encourage us. And ultimately, Lord, we want to be strengthened so that we can leave this place and be the men and women that you have called us to be in this city. Oh, we need you and we need to hear from you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So it's interesting, you know, we're, we're here, New Day Church. Uh, there's lights, there's sound. Uh, we, you know, there's coffee and all kinds of things going on uh, in this building, and, and, and you're not asleep in bed. You're, you're awake here at 1040 a.m. on a Sunday, and you could be asleep, or you could be, like a lot of people, just waking up and getting ready to go eat brunch or something like that and pay way too much for overpriced eggs. Like, like that could be you, but you're here this morning. And why? Like, why, why do we choose to come here instead of going on and doing other things? Why do we choose to, to wake up early, to get the kids dressed? Look, I've got four of them, so I know how difficult it is to get kids up and to say the same thing over and over again. Get ready. Get ready. Put your socks on. Put your shoes on. I've said it 37 times. Why have you not done this? Brush your teeth. Clean up. You know, like all the things. Like, you went through all of that this morning, and Why? Like, why would we do this instead of just sleeping in? It's certainly a lot easier. It certainly will frustrate you a lot less if you've got little kids in the house. Uh, you know, it, there, there are a lot of things that you could be doing, and yet you have chosen to come here and worship God because ultimately we see that there is value, and, and not just like minimal value, but ultimate value and virtue when we come together to celebrate and sing 
songs of praise and to read Scripture and to hear His Word preached and taught upon, like, that's, that, like there's something about that. And people on the outside who haven't experienced it, they don't get it. That's why they're asleep right now. That's why they're not here. That's why they're not gathering. They don't get it. But for those people who have experienced the goodness of God and the presence of God, as we've just heard this testimony from Evan, for, for those people who have truly experienced God, then, you know, like, it's worth it to come together, to wake up, to sacrifice something in order to be in a place like this. And we don't count this, like, lightly. Like, there are places all around the world right now where believers are gathered, but it's in secret, And it's underground, because to gather in a space like this would get them thrown in prison or killed. And so we're able to come together, and this might be maybe a little heavy to get things started, but I think it's important for us to understand why we are here. And for people on the outside looking in, like, why are they gathering together? It's because God is worthy of praise and worship. We look at this Psalm of David in Psalm 24, and it's important for us to understand what David is trying to get across. And he shows us right from the get-go in verse 1, where he says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And the first thing that he wants us to understand is that the earth is the Lord's. It's his. All of this is his. He made everything, and it belongs to him. Now, what would spur David to say what he's saying? Most likely, this psalm was written after a very dark time in the nation of Israel. If you go to the book of 1 Samuel, you begin to see that God is working. And Samuel is born from a woman who could not bear kids and prayed fervently and then sends her son to go live at the temple and serve under Eli, who at the time is the high priest. And Eli had corrupt sons and there's the, who, were, who were rulers uh, or leaders as well. And he turned an eye to what they were doing. And there arose a day, and you see this in 1 Samuel chapter 4, where the nation of Israel goes out to battle, and and they get destroyed. And they all come back together, and they're trying to figure out, like, why did we lose? Why, Why did we lose this battle? Like, what's going on? And then they go, aha, we didn't have the Ark of the Covenant with us. Well, let's go get the Ark and then, like, bring it back to battle, and let's try this thing again. And so after the second attempt, They don't just get destroyed again. The ark gets taken by the Philistines. The news comes back to Eli, who's standing at the gate of the city. And he's like, and when he hears of the battle, he's so overcome with grief and despair that he falls over and dies. And the ark, which housed the presence of God, is no longer with Israel for 20 years years. Along comes David, who begins to lead the nation. They take the Ark of the Covenant back, and now they're marching back to Jerusalem. It's this incredible sight and scene. And so, in preparation is the presence of God in the Ark is coming back to the nation. He makes this point, the earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. The earth belongs to God. He has made everything. Everything that's in it belongs to him, which even means us and our lives. They belong to God. And it's interesting, side note about what gets us to this whole point, like the presence of God is not something that we just like conjure up when we need something and pay lip service to him. 
I find it fascinating that the nation of Israel actually showed up to battle without the ark. Like they, like they got their weapons, they had the, the torches, they had all the things. And like, do we need the ark? No. And nobody thought like, hey, let's bring the ark. And it's not until after they step into this battle and they lose and life hits them and their enemies are standing over them in defeat, they're like, hmm, what went wrong? And then they all of a sudden go, well, well, the ark, we didn't have the ark. But I love what God does here. They lose even the ark because, like, the presence of God is not something that we just conjure up when we need him. And for what it's worth, his, the fullness of his presence wasn't restricted to the ark. But what becomes important, and you got to see this as David is marching with the Levites and the nation and the armies back to the city and bringing this ark back, the earth is the Lord's. It's not about the ark, it's about the God who chooses to abide within the ark. And ultimately, wherever God chooses to abide is holy ground. And so ultimately, all this points to the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty is ultimately uh, what's at play in all of this. We don't worship this building. We worship the sovereign God who chooses to meet us in this building this morning, right? And he's the same God that will be with you as you're driving on your way out. He's the same God that will be with you as you go to work. He's the same God that will be with you as you are in your homes with your families and all the things that you will do. And, and, and so, like, it, 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 we don't worship the things. We worship the God who created all of these things. And this idea of the God of creation is a reoccurring credential that comes out throughout all of the scriptures. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In Job chapter 38, as Job is frustrated with God and his friends and all the things that has happened to him, God comes back to him and says, were you there when I created the earth? Were you there when I laid down the foundations? Were you there? No, because he's letting him know I was the God of creation. Ironically enough, in Jonah, as Jonah is running from God, and he's sailing off to Tarshish on the boat, and the storm comes, and everybody on the boat is like, man, somebody's God has to be really upset right now. And of course, it's Jonah, and he's asleep on the, in the bottom of the boat. They wake him up, and he says one of the most fascinating things. He says, I, I serve the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. And that's the one who's afflicting us. Jonah chapter 1. This continuously comes up. I could cite a million places throughout all the scriptures. But understanding that you serve the God who created everything is the beginning place of worship. It's the beginning place of where perspective begins. You don't start at the end, you start at the beginning. And if you start at the beginning, it ultimately brings us to the point that we serve the God who created everything. So the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers." I've said this, I say this oftentimes when I'm talking to people, but when you begin to contemplate God's creation, it helps us to understand how small we are and also how big he is. I get fascinated with these things. This is why I love the movie Interstellar and the, any, pretty much anything space and sci-fi. I just love contemplating the universe and things. And, and, and there was a video I watched recently uh, that um, I think it was by Infographics. But th- this video was entitled, the, the Universe is Bigger Than You Think It Is and It'll Terrify You. 
And you're like, you live on earth. And it's like this. And it's like, and then the moon is here. But actually, it's really this far apart. And actually, in comparison to Venus, we're actually really this small. And in comparison to the sun, we're actually this small, which actually the galaxy is this. And then they like pan out and show like, like a, a, a cluster of galaxies. And actually, earth is this small, bite-sized pixel on this video right here in the midst of all of these things. And it, it, you just keep going back and back and back. And they're like, the observable universe is this, but actually the universe is much bigger than that. And at the end of the video, you're like, oh my goodness. And here's the crazy part. We serve that God who created all of that. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all those who dwell in it. But the second thing then we see isn't just that this this thesis statement where it begins where the earth is the Lord's, but the, the next thing that we see as he transitions is that blessings then come from God. Our blessings come from the one who created everything. And this is really important. Look look at what we see here in verse 3. It says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Like, who's able to come into the presence of, of the one who created all of that. This past week, there was a little bit of controversy in the sports celebrity world, uh, and it involved a pair of celebrities that it's wild that it even exists, uh, that this situation existed. But if you follow sports, then maybe you've heard of this. There's a, a, a French basketball player who just got drafted number one overall by the San Antonio Spurs, uh, uh, Wembenyama, Victor Wembenyama. Uh, And he uh, was in, I believe, Las Vegas for the NBA Summer League. He was at a restaurant that just so happened that Britney Spears was at. I know, this gets wild. Britney Spears recognized Victor because he's a seven foot five man. Uh, uh, So, you know, like very hard to not know who that's who he is. And she was excited to like meet Victor. So she ran up to Victor and tried to tap him on the shoulder and be like, oh my gosh, Victor. I'm sure in Britney Spears' world, it's like, I'm Britney, you know, Uh, everybody knows me. Uh, But at the end of the day, uh, uh, Victor Wemiana's security did not really know or care uh, that it was Britney. All they knew was like some random person tried to tap the guy that they were there to secure. And so one of the security guards, uh, and there's a little bit of debate and controversy because, you know, that's how this thing goes about what exactly happened. But at some point, as she tried to tap the shoulder, they smacked that hand down like, nah, you're not, you're not touching Victor. And, which then she ended up hitting herself in the face and like this whole like scene like just gets really crazy between Victor and Britney Spears. Like this is random. Some poor 19-year-old kid from France is having a run-in with, with, with Britney Spears. Now, the part that was crazy to me about this was like, like one, Victor's a seven-foot-five man. They, literally, they nickname him like he's a unicorn. He's a seven-foot-five man who dribbles the ball like a point guard and shoots threes, and everybody's like, he's the greatest prospect since LeBron James. Like, this, this guy is supposed to be really, really good. And, 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 and when you look at him, you can just see, I mean, seven-foot-five is seven-foot-five. Like, like, you have to be an athlete. And he's walking through Vegas, and he's got this entourage of people that are around him, and their job is to make sure that only people who are authorized to be in his presence can actually do that. And it actually doesn't matter who you are and what your credentials are. If you haven't been given clearance to be in Victor's presence, then you can't, which is crazy because Britney Spears, like, is a celebrity, you know, like, like she's done things and all that kind of stuff. Like she, she sings songs, but she did not have access and Victor's just a basketball player, y'all. I mean, like, and he actually hasn't played a single game of NBA basketball. But the reality, and this is what I took away from this whole story, is that if any of us see Victor, like when the Spurs play the Rockets, you can't just walk up to him and have a conversation. Like, you've got to have authorization to get to the man. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And then we get to verse 3, 
so who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in this holy place? Like, like if God created everything, then, then who can actually be in his presence? If God created everything and everything belongs to him, then how do we get clearance? How do we get access? And in verse 4, we get it. He who has clean hands, that's step one, a pure heart, two, and who does not lift up his soul to what is false, for, and does not swear deceitfully. That, that's it. That's the standard. It's like, oh, well, that's good. No, that's terrible. The, who, who in us, who of us is actually all of those things at all times? None of us. None of us are. The problem is that none of us are righteous. That's what Romans 3.10 tells us. Romans 3.10 is actually quoting Psalm 53, making the point that none of us are righteous, none of us seek for God, none of us actually want what is right, all of us are wicked. I mean, this joke gets made often, but all you got to do is, like, watch kids, and you see, like, you got to teach them to do right. And kids are disobedient from the jump. One of my favorite stories about being a parent was when I was, uh, we were wild enough to have two kids. Um, uh, our oldest was, we were se- he was seven months old when we got pregnant with, our, with our, our second child. So he was 16 months old when we had a newborn in the house. That was wild, a wild time in our lives. Two kids under a year and a half. Uh, Lord help us. And he did, um, but it was, it was crazy. And there became this moment because siblings, like, like they love each other. It was hard at first, but then the older two became best friends. And there was this incredible moment when my daughter was nine months old. And you're like, Mac, we're talking about sin. I'm like, yes, trust me, this nine-month-old, uh, it was wild. I, I, I remember they, they were sharing a room at the time, and uh, my, my oldest son, he had his toddler bed, and, and then she was in her crib, and all my kids walked at nine months, all four of them, so, you know, like, like she could walk and do things. Uh, and I put them to bed, and I'm like, go to sleep. And then I walk into the living room, I sit down, I turn on the baby monitor, and when I look, there goes my oldest jumping in the bed, just turning up. Ah! And then my daughter was standing up at the edge of the crib and she was headbanging. Ah! And I was like, what is, what, is, what is happening? So I go right back into the room. I open the door and I'm about to go like, go to sleep. Now here's the part that's crazy. Uh, my oldest son, his bed, like when you open the door, that's the first thing that you saw. And he is much more like contrite and like as soon as he gets busted, repentant, all that kind of stuff. So I open the door, and he just freezes. He starts crying, like, I've been bad, you know, like, that, that's, that's like his whole thing. My daughter, on the other hand, at nine months old, true story, uh, she recognized at nine months old that I was not the first, she was not going to be the first person that I saw. And so when I opened the door, she had dropped to the bed and was pretending to be asleep. <laughs> and here's the part that makes me mad. I was like, girl, I know you're awake. And she goes, uh, and pretends like I woke her up. I was like, you liar. You liar. You're a liar. That's what you are. No, I mean, but like nine months old. Like that was just innately in there. Like just, you're, oh, it makes me mad now to this day. Like you are so lying. So I'm like, like so, so here's the thing. None of us are good. You got to teach good. We, 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 we are born into sin. This is something that we consistently see throughout Scripture. And, and the point is, is that none of us have clean hands. None of us have a pure heart. None of us actually uh, 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 avoid what is false. And all of us lie. And so, like, there's no way for us to be able to have access based on our own merit to God. But then verse 5 takes it a step further because he's talking about this righteous person and he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from, from the God of his salvation. So there's this tension taking place here. Clearly, none of us have pure, hand, pure hearts and clean hands and all of those things. And yet, there is a way for us to receive blessing from the Lord and to come into his presence. And it's in this key part that we see from the God of his salvation. 
Because our righteousness, our goodness doesn't come from our goodness. It comes from him. And everything points to the God of our salvation. And coupled with verse 6, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, that those who seek God will find him and be saved. I don't think you understand the magnitude of what, that, what we just said right there. If you did, we would have had a praise break right here in the middle of this room. Uh, th- those who seek God will find him and be saved. Let me put it to you like this. Many years ago, in fact, I'm about to celebrate my 20-year high, reun- high school reunion. So 20 years ago, I graduated from high school. And I'm like making decisions about where I'm going to college. And I picked my college, and then I saw the price tag, and I was like, mm, don't have that kind of money uh, in $2,003. And then I was like, I need a scholarship. Uh, and so then I began to apply for scholarships as people do. And I got my scholarships, and then I also, you know, worked to, uh, it, you know, for most of my time in college while I was in ministry. And, and so, you know, that's how I paid for school. But it was fascinating, like, looking for scholarships. Because scholarships are this fascinating thing. Like, it is money that people have set aside. Like, it's already there. And if you apply for the scholarship then you can receive the funds that have been designated. It seems pretty simple. But it's believed that in any given academic year, over $100 million goes unclaimed in scholarships every year. That is money that people have set aside, and it is yours for the taking. But it goes unused, not because it didn't exist, because people didn't actually apply. I want you to wrap your minds around that. People are having conversations about student loan debt and and all the things that are going on. Every year, over $100 million goes unclaimed. And yet, every year, there are people whose lives are changed by the scholarships that they receive that literally couldn't have gone to college if they did not get the scholarship, literally couldn't have done the things that they're doing or be where they are if they did not receive those scholarships. But the money has been provided, so it's not an issue of capacity, but there is an issue of people knowing that the money has been provided. God's grace and mercy exists and is ready to be given and lavished out on all those who seek him. And here's the crazy part. No matter what you've done, no matter how much you've sinned, no matter how far short of perfection you have come up in your life, the moment that you seek him, his grace will be applied to your life. That's why I love that, 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 that uh, chorus, thank you, Jesus, for your blood applied. Because anybody who has sinned and has asked God for sp- forgiveness for specific things, not just generally I'm a sinner, Lo- no, Lord, I fell short in these ways. Like if you've been forgiven for specific things, then it's a reason to shout and to praise. Because none of us are righteous, none of us are good enough, none of us are perfect, all of us fall short of perfection, and yet the grace of God stands ready. And the reason why we go out into the streets, into the marketplace, into our communities, we share the name of Jesus, because there are people every single day that do not know that there is a God who created everything, who doesn't just sit high, but literally condescended down to man in the flesh. 
and lived as one of us, a sinless, perfect, spotless life, and then died on the cross for our sins, paying the penalty that we could not pay. And then he arose from the grave, a historical fact, as our testimony today told us, for you. And people don't know that. So, so how do we get into God's presence? How do we have a pure heart and clean hands? How do we uh, yearn for truth? By seeking God. When we seek him, we will find him, and he will save us. It is a guarantee and a promise from him. And so blessings come from him, but it, it culminates then in these last couple of verses and Look, he's here. Look at what we have here. Lift up your heads, verse 7, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The chorus of this song, which is repeated over and over and over again. Lift up your heads, and who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O gates. I, I'm, if you're like me and you grew up in church, you heard this said a lot. And I would see people in church, the choir or whatever, they would be sing, lift up your heads, and everybody would be like, yes, God. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I would raise my hands like other people. I had no idea what this verse was talking about. Like, O gates, what gates? In fact, uh, a quick Google search, it's pretty funny the way you, if you type this in, what is lift up these gates? And it automatically fills in it. What does that mean? It sounds really churchy. It sounds really good. And it sounds like something that I should be excited about when I read it. But what is it? What is it? What are the gates? Let's remember our context here. The nation of Israel has been without the ark for 20 years. For 20 years, they've been going through ritual sacrifice, been doing the things, but they knew that the presence of God was far. And they were doing these things in obedience, looking to the day that the ark would come back and God's presence and blessings would be back. And one day it actually happens if you're a note taker and you want to go read later on this week in what happened, go to 2 Samuel chapter 6 or 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Those are the two places that detail the ark coming back. But what gets important is this processional of the ark is headed back to the city and the gates naturally are closed. Why? And it's pretty simple. You have doors to your house. The doors keep things out. It's pretty simple. It's also an entry point for you to actually come in. It's your house. You need a door to get in. You build up walls to protect. You have a door. That's where you walk in. None of you guys, when you get home, if everything is working properly, crawl in through the window to get into your house. Everybody opens the door. It's just common sense. You're like, oh, man, I'm going to my car. I'm going to pop the trunk and, like, pull the seat down and crawl from the back end. No, you open the door. It's pretty simple. So the door is where you come in, but the door is also what helps you give a checkpoint to people that are not welcome. It's pretty simple. Somebody knocks on the door, boom, 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 boom. You look through the keyhole. You're like, mm, no. Uh, you're driving in your car. You're stopped at a stoplight. People start walking up to your car. You don't open the door or drop the window. You leave it shut like you're not coming in here. That's how this whole thing works. That's what doors and gates do. And so in this, David has personified the gates that you have been down 
and you and, and the city has been depressed because the presence of God has left this place. That's actually uh, Eli's daughter-in-law was so overcome when Eli died 20 years before, and she has a child and names the, the child Ichabod, which means the presence of God has left this place. And so the presence or glory of God had left this place, and now it's coming back, and it's saying, lift up your head, O gates. And it's this idea of personifying or making an analogy out of this whole thing that the gates being down was this idea of it being down, downtrodden and depressed, but lifting up is like this time of excitement and praise. No longer lower the gates, but lift up the gates so that the presence of God may come in. And then it's like, so the king can come in, and so then it naturally asks this question that technically has been answered at the beginning, but is going to be reaffirmed here in verse 8 and 10. Well, then who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. The contrast here, the nation of Israel 20 years prior had lost this battle, but God did not lose that battle. In fact, God has never lost the battle that he has chosen to fight. Oftentimes where we find ourselves, we find ourselves in defeat. Oftentimes we're fighting battles that God did not want us to fight. You went off into territories and places that God did not desire for you to go. Or you assumed that God wanted you to do certain things, and then you were like, oh, wait a minute, like the nation, uh, 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 maybe we should have thought, consulted God about what we were about to do before we did it. But the Lord is mighty in battle. And while they had lost their battles 20 years prior, it was God in this moment who had got them victory, who had brought them victory. And they recognized that the king of glory was coming into their presence. The one of armies. That's what the Lord of hosts means. The Lord's strong in battle. And as we close things out here, our worship team is, is going to come back up. We get to worship. We get to come into the presence today. of The king of glory. The one who has never lost a battle. In fact, God is so sovereign in his victory that even when he sent his son to die on the cross, death was winning. What would be losing for all of us was victory for him. That's why you see those words, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? defeated at the cross. I don't know where you are here today, but this is what I do know. Everything that we have belongs to God. And because of that, the only way that we can receive blessing in life is by seeking Him. And here's the great part. You don't have to go far because the King of glory is here. He is here. And whatever it is that has caused you to seek him today, you will find the ultimate answer in him. For some of you, that means putting your faith in God for the first time. Saying, I, I know that I'm not righteous. I know that I don't have clean hands or a pure heart or any of those things. But I do know that Jesus lived the life I could not and died for my sins. But for others of you, maybe that's not where you are. Maybe you're like, I, I, I know that I follow, follow God. 
But I, I ask you this question. Verse 6 says, such is the generation of those who seek him. It's one thing to know who God is and to go through ritual. It's another thing to actually seek him earnestly. And to seek him consistently. Are you seeking him? He would have his way in your finances, in your marriage, in your relationships at work, relationships in your family who you are as a citizen. Does the fact that you serve the king of glory actually define everything about who you are or is it just a footnote or another piece in the puzzle of all other things? Or do you wear other hats or other labels more prominently in your life? The earth is the Lord's and all who dwell in it. No matter what, choose this day to submit all areas, all aspects of your life to God. Because ultimately, that is where you will find peace. That is where you find joy. That is where you find life. And that is where we will find God's blessing. Because when we submit our lives to him, everything, in acknowledgement that it all belongs to him anyway. And if there's one thing that I'm trying to teach my children, your life belongs to him. And more important than my hopes and dreams for your life is what God desires to do in you and through you. And so is that what drives you today? But we all have a reason or way to resp- or a way that we need to respond to the King of Glory this morning.